Remain standing, we'll read our passage uh, this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. This is the word of the living God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for you to instruct us in this heart issue that uh, often is a... Uh, um, a detriment uh, to marriage partners and also to society, but mainly for your glory. And so we pray that you would show us your glory and the blessings you've given us through faithfulness and holiness and righteousness in these matters. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Slogans. Slogans. There are slogans here in which Paul is interacting with. Uh, they're almost like advertisements in a way. And so I wrote a few advertisements and just see if you could figure out uh, who, who is behind these. Just do it. Nike. Have it your way. Burger King. A diamond is forever. <laughs> De Beers. So there's just, I mean, there's a whole, if you just looked them up, you just find all kinds of, any kind of advertisement on TV or whatever has got some kind of catchy slogan that's trying to, to get you to look at it, think about it, embrace it, be motivated by it, uh, uh, and, and to follow through with a few uh, bucks of yours uh, changing hands there. And so in today's context, the Corinthians have some slogans. Uh, they could have been learned. Uh, Paul is actually not going to refute their truth in a particular way, but he's going he's to have to refine the scope of what application they are to have. So let's look at slogans of the Corinthians first, 12 through 14. Paul writes, all things are lawful for me. That's one of the slogans, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Like I said, slogans are often used as guiding principles, or they're offered as guiding principles, or to govern a person's thinking, living, spending. Um, and here the Corinthians have two that shape the way that navigates their daily, um, daily urges or uh, their recreation or how they think about life in general. And these are some of the most powerful ones. You have an aspect in, which involves procreation on the one side, and then you also on the other have this idea of, of daily bread or sustenance for life. But they've got things out of whack. They've run too far with their applications. 
All things are lawful for me. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. The idea behind their position on these, their thinking, their acting, their behavior is I can do whatever I want with whatever I have. I can do whatever I want to my heart's content no matter what the consequences are, either to myself, to my neighbor, or to the Lord. And it's that to the Lord is going to be the governing principle. So the first one in 1A, when Paul says, all things are lawful for me, the Corinthians took their freedom in Christ and applied it to all of life, which is appropriate, but even to sinful things, even to things that dishonored the Lord. And so Paul counters with godly parameters. He, he counters with godly parameters. He never says that that statement is not true, but because it might contain some truth depending on how you understand it and how you apply it and how you think about it, but it may also be used for license. And so Paul wants to uh, limit the direction or the application of what that slogan means. We're not saved in order to sin or to remain in sin. We're saved from sin. We're saved for the glory of God. We're saved for personal holiness and righteousness and obedience to God's word. And not everything we choose to do leads to God's glory or our personal holiness. Not everything that we do or choose to do or think about is really for the benefit of my neighbor. So Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. Not everything that we think about doing or want to do or try to do is going to be helpful. The idea here is to be of use, to be profitable, or to be advantageous. And so then we have to ask the question, be of use for what? To be of use to whom? To be profitable for whom? To be profitable in what way or advantageous in what direction? And the answer is for God's glory. Is it useful for God's glory? Is it profitable for God's glory? Is it advantageous to magnify God and Christ? Is it, is it helpful in that direction? Is it helpful for my neighbor in their blessing to come to know the God and creator of all? In fact, does this, what I'm thinking about, what I'm doing, how I'm using my money, how I'm using my words, is it, is it moving towards the trajectory of fulfilling the two great commandments? To love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. And that will then be a clarifying idea as you begin to respond to is this lawful for me and then he goes into the next one all things are lawful for me so Paul actuates accentuates this idea of lawful meaning master he's looking at it from a uh, you know is, is this is this allowable uh, for me to do because I am, I am over the law in a way. And so the slogan can be interpreted as, I am master of all things. I'm the master of all things. And so Paul reminds the Corinthians that sin is actually seeking to be their master. Just because Jesus has delivered them out of the power and dominion and the consequences of that sin doesn't mean that sin is not still actively trying to bind them. And so if the Corinthians are offering themselves to sin, they are offering to be held captive again. They're, they're asking to be enslaved once more. It would be like the Israelites of old having been released from, from Egypt's uh, snare and from uh, Pharaoh's grasp, just, just pining to go back there so that they could make more bricks without straw. Um, and so Paul says, you know, all things are lawful for me, but, he's going to give an alternate uh, clarifying thing, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Sin seeks to enslave, 
And Paul's saying, do not offer yourself to slavery anymore. You have already been released from that by Christ. And so you can begin to think about this. Uh, kids ask these questions all the time about, uh, uh, particularly about drink, about alcohol or whatever. And so in this thing, Paul is saying, well, possibly it's lawful for you, possibly, but what are you taking into consideration? Are you taking uh, the Lord into consideration as you navigate whether to have a glass of wine or uh, a beer? Uh, is he involved in this decision making? Have you prayed about it? Have you asked godly counsel? Uh, because oftentimes people will just run headlong into something that may be allowable and then 20 years later you find out that they have now been enslaved by that very thing. That, there is so many things uh, related to that. It's not just um, you know, uh, smoking and drinking and chewing, as he used to be told. And so he's really trying to help them navigate what, what is actually helpful and beneficial for the Christian in their lives, in, com in communion with the Lord and in community with one another and with their society. And then he goes to the next one. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. So catch catch this little catchy phrase. It's like a, a marketing ad guy would just love to be able to come up with the way this is phrased. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. It's just, it just like doubles it up. I mean, you could just rattle that off all the time. Madison Avenue would love it. Uh, they'd make cards and, and, and uh, uh, commercials and banners and all kinds of stuff to get people to come eat at their restaurants, you know. Uh, but Paul doesn't refute that idea either. It has a basic ring of truth in a way if you understand it correctly. But the Corinthians had just, just carte blanche accepted everything that then related to this. So they had misapplied it. So Paul says, but... You know, God gives us food to eat. He knows how our bodies are. He created us. He made your body. He gave Adam and Eve an entire garden. And he said, eating you can eat, meaning eat your fill. Eat your fill. Enjoy all of these things. But there's a misuse of that, isn't there? There's an aspect in Corinthian culture, and we'll see it run through this passage, in which they believed that the body uh, was not good. Uh, there was something um, about the body that was potentially, or was evil in and of itself. And so people would go in separate directions with what to do with this body. So there was a belief system that the body was a prison house of the soul, and if you'd be great if you didn't have this body. You know, you see it degrade over time. You, you lose your eyesight. You lose your hair. Your, uh, you get wrinkles. Uh, maybe your big, strong muscles uh, don't look so big and strong by the end of your life, those types of things. Uh, and so people would just go in different directions. Some would indulge the body as if, it didn't matter. It was not going to pass into eternity. You were going to be released from your body at death, and then your soul would just be free to be wherever the soul was to be. And so people would just overeat whatever they wanted. We see a, the reverse side of that is people say, well, if the body's evil, then I'm going to, I'm going to starve the body. I'm going to beat my body. Um, I'm going to hit myself with, uh, you know, a whip or whatever. And so there was all of this in the Corinthian culture. And so Paul is saying, you know, both of these things are going to pass away. They're going to be done away with. Food, if you just leave it out on the counter, will be destroyed. God has built it into uh, our our world that that is going to rot and go back to dust or whatever and your body your body is also going to be done away with because you're going to get a new body 
The body that you have right now will be done away with. The food that you have right now, if left alone, will perish, and your body will be changed or transformed to your glorified body as you belong to Jesus. And so the body is highly, highly important. Paul writes this. He says, The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So he takes the slogan again, uh, food for the stomach, the stomach for food, and he turns it on itself and says, uh, the Lord, you're for the Lord and the Lord is for your body. And so he offers them an alternative way to think about their bodies, their lives, their uh, intimate moments, all of these types of things. And he lifts it up to where it is supposed to be and intended to be, and that is the glorification of God Almighty in the creation. He says, your body is not meant for sexual immorality. It's for the Lord. I love how Paul understands the Corinthian culture. They loved these turns of phrases. They loved argumentation. They loved pontification. They loved to listen to great storytellers and uh, lawyers and uh, all of these types of things. They would love American TV now, right? And so Paul just engages them where they're at and says, how about this for a slogan that you can live by? Your body's for the Lord, and the Lord is for your body. This is the overarching trajectory of our lives, to give everything we have and everything we are to magnify the Lord. Now that's a clarifying reality. That's higher and more substantial and more pervasive than the slogans that the Corinthians were holding to to help navigate their lives about particular issues. Here's one that helps you navigate the entirety of your life your thought, word, and deed. Does what I'm about to do, does what I'm about to say, does what I'm about to think magnify the glory, the majesty, the beauty, the supremacy, the holiness of Almighty God? Does it magnify His Son, Jesus Christ? And so notice He actually even brings in resurrection as a help, as an instructional tool, as a, uh, as a reality for the Corinthian believers. Look at verse 14. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So the resurrection of Jesus isn't something that just has um, importance on Easter and a celebration just on Easter. It actually governs our daily lives, the mundane aspects of our lives. Paul just, I mean, he just runs straight to it. You've got a problem. How in the world does the resurrection life apply to this particular issue? With the Corinthians, it had to do with uh, their uh, intimate moments, and it had to do with their daily bread, and he just goes straight to the resurrection. Straight to the resurrection. So Paul, what he does is he's elevating the body beyond just the merely mundane or just the, the, uh, the ability to satisfy urges or needs in our human lives. He points to a higher calling in our lives. Our lives are meant to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And not just our souls, but our bodies. How can I use my body to magnify the Lord? How can I use my body in the way in which I eat? Do I eat proper portions? Do I eat healthy? They're just super simple little things. Am I overindulging? Do I eat because I'm stressed? Do I not eat because I'm worried about body shape or body image? It's it's, it's so pervasive in, in this teaching, particularly for young people or for people who are struggling about their body image. He's saying you're going to have a body, you're going to have a body that is meant to go the distance so that you can magnify God in your body forever. Believers are saved, not just their soul, We're redeemed, not just our soul, but we're redeemed as soul and body. It's how we were created. 
Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians that he is going to feel strange without a body, but he's going to look forward to the fact that he's going to get a new body, you know? And so he is, he is, teaching, he is teaching these immature Corinthian Christians about their bodies, their souls, their desires, how to stand against the onslaught of a culture that's trying to teach them, captivate them for ungodly ways of living and worshiping because this has to do with the worship in Corinth as well. There was a temple to Aphrodite there and it just had uh, folks available. It would have been as easy as walking into McDonald's uh, here in America is to walk into the temple of Aphrodite and just do whatever you wanted. In fact, they, the, the culture probably wondered why the Christians didn't do that more often. And so Paul is saying, look, you belong to the Lord. Uh, he has redeemed you in your soul and your body. Begin to live uh, in that newness of life. But he doesn't end there. He, he, he attacks the slogans of the Corinthians, puts them in the proper perspective. He offers them the resurrection as a help, and then he reminds them of their union with Christ, verse 15 to 18. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin and a person Every, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Once again, Paul asks the question, which we find running through chapter 6 of Corinthians, do you not know? Are you unaware, Corinthians, of the implications of your salvation, of your deliverance, of your, of your new birth, of your, of your calling in the Lord? Are you ignorant of this fact? Or has it not occurred to you that? Are you actually living in purposeful disobedience to the fact that you're in union with Christ, that you have a, uh, you've been raised to new, new of life with Christ, in Christ's resurrection, that the Christian faith, the scripture uh, that you have is to govern the whole of your life. The old is gone, the new has come. Wake up, open your eyes. Why are you still living in a, a, a pagan lifestyle when what Christ offers you is superior for the glory of God, for you and for your relationships. The idea here that Paul is talking about, of course, he runs back to Genesis, uh, the first marriage of Adam and Eve. The two will be one flesh. The man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they will become one. They're going to be knit together in this spiritual as well as physical way. It's the building blocks of relationships. It's the building blocks of a family. It's the building blocks of culture and nations. And Paul just takes the Corinthians back. Look, this is foundational to all of life. This is how God designed us to be together as a husband and a wife, in a family, and in a society. And so then he begins to say, think about that in, in terms of your, in your uh, attempts at uh, uh, physical pleasure or procreation or whatever. As surely as Adam and Eve were brought together to, uh, to each other by God, so God has also now given you to Jesus. It is a powerful concept. You are to be united with Christ as as powerfully and as passionately as a husband and wife are on their bed. There are words here that uh, have this idea that every single believer is glued to Jesus. It's a bond. It, uh, it's a knitting together. Uh, in which there is no ability to separate. 
So here's, a, here's, here's what Paul is saying to uh, the Corinthian uh, believers. As they're walking down the avenue in Corinth and all the people that they know are walking past the temple of Aphrodite and all of the uh, temple prostitutes are there. Some were men, some were women, and they're inviting people to come in and worship and people are turning aside and going in. Paul tells the Corinthian believers and he tells you and me, wherever you are as a Christian, whatever you're doing, Whatever you're thinking, whoever you're with, Jesus is right there too. He is right there. If you, Corinthian church, turn aside into the temple of Aphrodite, you're taking Jesus into that temple with you. And he gets so specific, he says, and you're making Jesus Christ, the Son of God, participate with you in this act of passion and pleasure. You're trying to knit the Son of God together with a prostitute. And then Paul says, never, never, never. Never. We are not to offer our bodies to immorality. We're to offer our bodies to the Lord in purity. God has, as you see here in this passage, he understands that that is a beautiful part of our lives for a husband and wife. And he understands that food is enjoyable. He didn't just make everything taste like a Brussels sprout. You know, he gives you uh, taste receptors so that you can enjoy uh, an ice cream uh, or um, your favorite steak or, or to have your favorite drink or whatever. He, he wants to bless us with the fullness of life, the joy of life, to have an abundant life, But there's also safety and and a proper bound for these things to occur. God doesn't withhold them from us. He gives us the, the places and the perspectives to enjoy them as they were meant to be enjoyed without them ensnaring us or us to be mastered by them. He wants us to live free, joy-filled, happy lives. And these are the parameters that he has set up for us to do that. And so Paul then says, flee sexual immorality. Flee. This harkens all the way back to Genesis again, chapter 39. Joseph in Potiphar's house. Potiphar had given him all kinds of authority and dominion over his household. Had withheld nothing from him save his wife. And his wife finds Joseph very appealing and makes advances against him all the time. And then there's a day when it's just Joseph and Potiphar's wife, and Potiphar's wife comes on really strong, and it says Joseph fled, ran away. She was holding on to him, and he just left everything and ran away. Away. This is the picture that Paul is saying to the Corinthian church. This is what God is saying to you and me if this is a part of our heart or our mind that we, we have this fantasy life where we're participating in things that are immoral and ungodly physically. He's saying run away as fast as you can. Get away from it. It's an emergency. Your life depends on this. There's there's a house burning down, and you better get out, or you're going to get burned alive if you stay. You're going to burst out into flames, so to speak. Fleeing uh, in this type of sin is also not merely physical. Just because somebody was uh, walked into Aphrodite's temple there in Corinth and then decided uh, they saw somebody and they just decided to leave. They might have gotten physically away, which is great, but where is their mind? Where is their heart? Where is their fantasy life? So this type of fleeing is not just physical, but it's also moral and spiritual. It goes to the very depths of who we are. And so God is saying, run away from any immorality, 
in your body, yes, definitely, but also in your mind and in your heart, in your fantasy life. So, so rather than do that, run towards purity and godliness and holiness and the proper boundaries of expression for these types of uh, humanity. There is a place to enjoy these things, but it's not with anybody other than your spouse. But it goes further. We are also to shame that type of behavior and speak against it. So we are to promote not just in ourselves, but with our, with our language, with our discipleship, from the pulpit, in your homes, that this is, these are the, these are the ways in which God has ordained us to relate to husband and wife. These are the joys and the blessings of this union and only this union. And also, this is how we should think about food. It's, it's very interesting how one we see promoted heavily in our society and pushed in an immoral way upon all members of the society, but we also see that in terms of food and dietary is also pushed. Gluttony on the one side, eat all you can, just keep stuffing it in, and body shaming, particularly of women, on the other. And God has, has a beautiful, wise way to think about our bodies. And then verse 19, the new temple, the new temple. So he just keeps, he's, he's starting in a negative, uh, started with negative things that were going on in the Corinthian church. And now what you see is he's, he is building and erecting this godly building. He's giving them ways to think, avenues to pursue, that he might not just say, stop doing that. He's actually going to say, so do this instead. And so that's what he does. He reminds them of the new temple, verse 19a. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Do you not know? Again, <laughs> you see how poorly they had progressed in their Christian understanding. They're believers, they're saints, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but they look really a lot like the culture from which they came. And Paul begins to remind them over and over because they had been bragging early on in uh, 1 Corinthians that they had no need and they had no lack, and he just keeps saying, that right there is ego, that was pride. You don't even understand these basic understandings of the Christian life. And so here he goes. <laughs> Do you see how immature understanding of the gospel, the word of God, your growth in Christ, do you see how much that theology, that bad theology affects your behavior? Your interactions with your neighbors, with the culture, with yourself, with your heart, with your mind, with worship, with the things of the Lord, with your body, with your food. And so Paul's understanding, he says, these, these people, I wish they were mature, they're not. And so therefore, they need more education. They need more discipleship. We need to be in prayer for them. We need to write to them. We need to be in their lives. We need to encourage them. We need to put forth a, a model of living. Paul says multiple times, imitate me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. We're going to show you what this looks like. We're going to hold people accountable. If they're dismissive of the word of God, if they're dismissive of uh of right living and holiness. Um, they may be, need to be set outside the church for a while. And if they're repentant, then we'll, they're certainly welcome to come back. They are to grow into the fullness of their salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling is another way Paul writes it to the Philippians. You've got your salvation. Now, now live it out. Figure out what it means. And so he offers this, this corrective your body is not for you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. The word for you here in this uh, section, both are singular. Sometimes in the English we don't know if, if uh, uh, they're talking about you plural 
or if they're you singular because of the, they're just used interchangeably. But these are both singular words. So Paul is talking to each individual member of the church when he says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. He could be sitting there saying, you, Tracy, <laughs> your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then go to the next one. Susie, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. And you just go around to every single person in that church. Do you realize that your body is inhabited by Almighty God, the Creator, in the Holy Spirit. There are often several times that uh, the word temple is written of in the New Testament. Normally there's two different words. One of the words, uh, when it's talking about the temple, includes all the surroundings, the walls, the court of the Gentiles, Solomon's porch, the court of women, all the different uh, houses and things that, where the Sanhedrin would meet. And this, sometimes it just includes that whole, what we would call the Temple Mount today. And then there's another word that just means the actual temple itself, uh, the holy place and the most holy place. And the word Paul uses here is that word, the actual holy place, the most holy place. Paul says that Christian people individually who have the Holy Spirit are the temple that is indwelt by God. Have you thought about the fact that when the, the curtain in the temple, when Jesus died, was ripped from top to bottom, where did the presence of, the, of, of God go? He began to indwell his people. We see that in the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit comes upon all believers. He didn't just leave his temple and go into outer space. He inhabits his people. You are possessive of the Holy Spirit of God. So what were some of the aspects of the temple? If, if, if my body is a temple, is the temple, and t t collectively we uh, also are the temple, wasn't it a sacred place? Wasn't it a holy place? Weren't there regulations throughout the Bible that just set up the temple in great detail and they had craftsmen work so diligently and God's spirit empowered them to be artists and craftsmen and uh, all these types of things to make it beautiful and glorious because, because the spirit of God was going to reside there. The manifested presence of God was going to place his name in that area. It was a place dedicated to God and exclusively dedicated to God in his worship. It wasn't a multi-use building. <laughs> we see that sometimes in churches they'll have a multi-use building. You have it set up for worship on Sunday and then the rest of the day they play basketball games in it or, or whatever, volleyball games. The temple was not like that at all. The temple was a, was a sanctified place. Everything in it, everything in it was only to be used for the worship and glory of God. It was dedicated to him. And it was a place then of blessing and communion in which God's people could come and meet with God. When David was being chased, he was like, I long to go and meet with God. When can I go and meet with God? And he longed to go back to the tabernacle and be in the presence of God. And Paul tells the Corinthians, and God tells you and me, this is your body. It is sacred to God. It is to be set apart for him, dedicated to him, used for him, and used for him exclusive in every single aspect. That's what our bodies are for. Not to indulge on the one side 
or to punish the body on the other. The Lord is for our bodies and we are for the Lord. And then he finishes up with this, that we're purchased by God, 19b and 20. He says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And so finally, he mentions the redemption of Christ. We've gone from these folks going into the temple of Aphrodite or wherever else they were going or indulging in all kinds of food, and he's working us through the most primary Christian doctrine that is applicable and will help release the Corinthians from their faulty thinking or from their passions. So he mentions the redemption of Christ at the cross. You were bought with a price. What price? How much did somebody pay for you? $5? $15? If you have, sometimes I've never been to one, but they have these like auctions, you know, where people are trying to raise money uh, for, for a cause or uh, donations or whatever, and they'll have people come up and say, oh, you know, who will give me $100 for this person? You know, you'll be able to go out on a date with them or have a meal with them or whatever, and somebody will say, ah, $100, and somebody will raise their thing, $200. Somebody will know $300. I think Brad Pitt got a whole bunch one time. Uh, and then somebody else didn't get hardly any. And so it's like, oh, well, how much are you worth? Well, when you came up on the auction block, Jesus bought you with his blood, not because you were all that great, but because his heart for you was that strong. And that was the only way that we would be purchased for God was for his son to give everything for you and me. It humbles us if we're proud and if our ego's big, because I'm on the auction block. I'm sold into slavery. I'm, I'm captive to the devil and to sin, and Jesus came in and bought me, not to pay the devil, but to pay God's own righteousness to satisfy God in his judgment against us. We were bought with a price, the most costly thing in the known universe, the blood of Jesus. Able to satisfy God the Father in his righteousness, able to secure sinful people to God forever. Now, this whole idea of you're not your own, it flies in the face of one of the most prized American concepts, personal autonomy. The idea that I'm an island unto myself, that I'm the captain of my own ship, that I'm the master of my domain, that, that uh, you know, that's what's going on right now in America. Who are you to say to me that I can't do this or do that? I don't want to be owned by anybody else. I don't want to be influenced by anybody else. I'll just, I'll just stand on my own two feet and you, the rest of y'all leave me alone. But there is not a single mere human being who doesn't have a master. We always, always have a master. Who is your master then becomes the question. For folks offering themselves in sexual immorality, they were offering themselves to be enslaved by sin again. And Paul is telling the Corinthian church, you belong to a different master. You belong to a master who loves you who sent his son into the world to die for you, that while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. He loves you. He's going to preserve you. He's going to keep you. This is the kind of master that you should be serving with your whole heart, not just the passions of your body, but with your soul and your mind and your strength and everything you have. So glorify God in your body. And let these, these great truths of Christian reality fuel that desire and passion to live and serve the Lord and to renounce 
sin and all its forms in your life and to replace it with obedience and affection for God, for your neighbor, and even for yourself. So Christ's redemption on the cross is displayed here on this table as well. Paul writes about it to the Corinthians. I pray that it's on your heart and on your mind daily as you think about living for the Lord. But it's displayed here on this table. It's a display of what it took to cleanse us from sin. It took the death of the Son of God. It's a display of God's love for us in that he has offered this atoning sacrifice on our behalf because we could never do it. And so he, is, he has himself offered to satisfy himself. And it's also a means of grace to enable us more and more to die unto sin and to live for God. Maybe you're weakened in, in your spiritual life right now. Maybe you're struggling with a thought life that dishonors the Lord or with a view of your body that dishonors the Lord. With this word of God that's preached and read and with this table, God desires to encourage you to more wholeheartedly serve him, live for him, love him. So he is providing you with all the grace and spiritual energy you need to do that. And so as uh, Doug said earlier, uh, that song that we sang, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy, uh, it was an invitation to come and meet with Jesus. And this is a very uh, specific way to do that. It's been instituted by the Lord Jesus himself. And he really does desire his people to be nourished and encouraged in him and through the means that he has provided for us.